for me personally, everything that I've that I have in terms of my career so far has been down to personal projects. So whether that's new clients when I was freelancing, or whether it's the role that I have now, or the first job out of out of university, um, I, I attribute all of that to personal projects. So I can't I can't stress more how how vital that is. I think, in my opinion. Um, for for your self-development and, and for your career, honestly. What is the best way to toast bread? This is the type of question a true designer asks of themselves. And speaking of designers, we're joined today by Sean Wellens. Sean is a fantastic creative with industrial design roots. He's also a visualization lead at Arrival. And he joins us today to talk about his design journey, philosophies, and as well to dissect all the things that intertwine to make up that thing we call a career and what we should be doing with it. So buckle up, like and subscribe and find out what Yu-Gi-Oh, Wallace and Gromit, Keenan and Kel and F1 all have in common in this wide-ranging interview. Let's go. Hey, let's do this. Um, hey everyone, welcome to the Lens Squared Podcast, and I'm delighted to welcome today's guest, the amazing Sean Wellens. Hey, Sean. Hi, Aaron. How's it going? Not bad, not bad. Thank you for joining me on this uh, nice, I guess, gloomy for you as well, um, Wednesday afternoon. Yes, very gloomy up here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's start with a, with a nice easy one, a nice intro for yourself. Um, for me, I'm just going to introduce you as this awesome, creative badass designer but um i guess from yourself to introduce yourself to the audience especially those who are probably brand new to the podcast brand new to this i guess creative realm in general um how would you describe yourself to to that person now who's listening completely fresh yeah well uh thank you for that and uh and obviously thank you for having me i uh i really appreciate the invite um yeah i guess the it, and I'm sure that you and, and many of the people listening can understand it's hard to really try and put put one title on, on, on what it is that, that I do. Um, and so I, I generally just try and uh, classify myself as, as an artist and a designer, um, mainly because my, my current role at the moment is a visualization lead for a company called Arrival, which is a, a startup electric vehicle manufacturer based in London. Um, and obviously, in my free time, I, uh, I spend a, a, a fair chunk of time doing concept design stuff. Uh, so it's really hard to to try and explain to people, perhaps outside of the industry or outside of uh, the, the creative realm, what it is that I do. So it's much easier to just describe myself as a, as a designer and artist, mm-hmm. for sure. And when did that kind of journey begin for you? Now, I guess, obviously, like, that's quite a, an open question because, you know, with creatives, it's kind of always been there. Um, obviously, I've heard yeah. people mention that it kind of like they, you know, it clicked for them that this is what I need to do kind of, let's say, when they're approaching adulthood. But that creative gene's like always been active. Um, but for yourself, like, what, do you know when that moment was when you realised that, okay, I need to be this artist and just create, I guess, in a professional mm-hmm. way? Yeah, I think in, in truth... Um... Like you've mentioned, a lot of us obviously feel as though we've been creative our entire lives. And, and, and there's plenty of times that I personally can look back on as a kid and think, you know, in, in hindsight, it's so obvious that I, w- I was going to end up doing something like this. So a good example would be, uh, did you ever watch the show Keenan and Kel on Nickelodeon? Of course, yes. Yes. Well, there was an episode where they made their own board game. And I, for some reason, I couldn't just... Um, which is which is a theme uh, throughout my childhood. I couldn't just enjoy that TV show for what it was, and that episode in particular, I had to go away. I got my Monopoly board out, covered it in paper, and <laughs> started make, started figuring out my own game, and then created little figurines out of um, out of play doh. Um, and just there are plenty of of um, sort of anecdotes like that. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that it ever really clicked um, until recently to be honest, until, you know, a few, about three years ago, I would say. So even, even after I graduated from university, um, I kind of always knew what it was that I was going to do from about 14. I decided that I was going to be a 
um, automotive designer. Mm -hmm. And so I picked my subjects at school and then, and then college based on that. And by the time it went to pick in something to study at university, I, I sort of lent into industrial design purely because of which I'm sure, again, a lot of people can relate to, um, the, the, the great work that Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive were doing at Apple mm -hmm. at the time. Um, that really was the thing that swayed me into going into industrial design as opposed mm -hmm. to automotive design. Um, but even, even then when I went to, to university, I wasn't, I, I didn't, again, in hindsight, realize what it was that I wanted to do. And yeah, it's only in the past three years or so that I've really started to, to find myself and, and as, as cheesy as it sounds, really find my voice and, and mm -hmm. the, the lane that I want to lean into the thing that I'm passionate about. And, and to be honest with you, I'm still discovering it now. I don't think that I'll ever stop. Um, you know, only recently I'm trying to rediscover what it was that made me excited about this kind of stuff as a kid, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, just trying to take a trip down memory lane and figure it out, figure out exactly what it was that, that made me happy. So do you remember Yu-Gi-Oh, for example? Of course. Yes, watched... yes. Yeah. So I was a huge Yu-Gi-Oh fan as a kid. So really just trying to, to sort of revive that, um, sort of spark that you used to have as a kid um, yes. about these kind of things. Wow. Um, first of all, your, the references you're dropping so far have been great. They're definitely the kind of stuff that <laughs> I've been into. Um, so that's, that's good to that's hear. Great. Um, and also like, um, a, a similar journey to yourself in my aspect, um, went through that industrial route also, um, since the age of a bit earlier, I think at the age of like when I was in year six at school, um, I was adamant that I wanted to be a car designer, um, again, similar to yourself. But then whilst I started studying that, it started to diverge and, the discovered concept art basically that was the thing that i realized that i was always wanted to do and that was kind of like the path to kind of lead me there and it's <clears throat> you know i can relate to that in the sense what you just mentioned yourself as is a case of like you discovered industrial design and decided you know not, i guess not decided but i guess that felt more kind of in sync with mm -hmm. the way you want to create i guess and the way you want to express yourself yeah and, mu and much more freedom of course, mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's almost come full circle. Obviously, I'm focused on CGI at the moment, but I, I've ended up at an automotive company. Um, for as different as it is, it's by far not traditional um, mm -hmm. compared to you know some of the some of the more uh, some of the older OEMs out there. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it is interesting to see that I've that I've come full circle in that sense. Okay, it's cool. Yeah. So regarding, I guess, university um, when you had graduated. Like, did you have any work lined up or what was your strategy at that point? Um, because I know with some people when they graduate, mm -hmm. a lot of things are uncertain. Some people are very like, you know, their sniper vision, they know exactly where they want to head towards and have a strategy laid out. Like, yeah. what was your situation in that, in that regard? Yeah, well, I think I knew by, by the time my final year came around, I think I knew that I kind of wanted to lean into the CGI route. That, that was the thing that I really enjoyed. Um, and so at the time I was, I was happy with the idea of just being able to get a job doing rendering for a living. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was lucky enough to have a job lined up before I graduated. Um, and that was for a company called Vax, who are a, a vacuum cleaner brand. They make air purifiers and, and things as well. But, um, yeah, if you, if you live in the UK, you, you've probably heard of them. If not, uh, then you, you probably haven't. But yeah, they're a vacuum cleaner brand and I, I was lucky enough, like I say, to, to get a job uh, before I graduated, which wasn't too common. Um, but it also wasn't common to do the things that I did to get the job either. So, mm. and this is definitely not advisable for anybody that's um, still, a, still at uni, especially in their uh, final year. But I was doing personal projects uh, during, during my final year of uni uh, and done. Uh, uh, I think that was a lot of the contributing factor towards me getting a job, which I suppose is, you know, I'm saying I don't advise it. It got me a job. But again, if, especially if you're on a course at, at Loughborough, um, it's quite intense. And I think the same as uh, there'll be some Brunel people listening and, and they'll be going crazy right now. Um, but yeah, Luff, Loughborough and Brunel, uh, uh, generally their courses are pretty intense. So the idea of doing a personal project or two alongside that is um, pure insanity and i'm not quite sure what i was thinking but like i say um it, it got me the job um 
so yeah, I was, like I say, I, I had a job before I graduated. So that, that time of, uh, of, of study was, was pretty relaxed by the time I'd handed in my final assessment. I wasn't too concerned cool. about job opportunities. Interesting. Um, and by you saying that you're doing personal projects, was that alongside, I guess, your final project or was that completely inexpensive, your final project, I guess? Oh, no, it was alongside. Yeah, there was, I, I, my final year project was obviously the priority, but I was um, putting a lot of time into 3ds max and v-rate for example just mm. just figuring that out and i think one of the projects was like a, a barber shop interior right. so it's not even like it bared any relevance to industrial design whatsoever um so again not quite sure what i was thinking but it, it paid off in the end for sure um and, and, and the thing is as well is a lot of the things that i'd learned whilst using that i used for my uh, uh final year project and, and other projects throughout the year at least for the rendering side of things of course and and actually which is something that's quite common these days, especially with tools like Blender being being free and, and, and a lot more popular than, than it used to be. I was using uh, poly modeling for just uh, concept designs, mm. uh, which which if anybody in the entertainment industry listening is sounds so obvious, right? Yeah. But in, in industrial design, that's that's not a thing that was done. It was thumbnail sketches and then uh, detail sketches and then you would go into CAD, right? And you would model up maybe two or three yeah, concepts yeah, yeah. To, to render out and display. The idea of skipping sketching altogether and going into 3D, especially in a poly package, which not many people in industrial design at the time used, um, was just, was more or less unheard of. I'm sure there, I'm sure it was used, but nobody in my year at least. Um, so again, trying to push myself, um, to, to actually use the tools that I had acquired whilst whilst going on these uh, borderline stupid personal projects during my final year, at least at least they uh, came in handy at some point. And why would you not advise anyone to do that? Like in terms of like, I guess I, I got an idea of what you're referring to, but just to be more, I guess more like explicit about it, like why what are you referring to when you say you wouldn't advise people to do it your way? Um. Well, it's not that I wouldn't advise it. I think I, I can only speak again from the point of view of somebody that went to Loughborough and I'm not trying to like toot my own horn or anybody's horn that went to, to Loughborough, but it was an extremely intense course. And I, I had a conversation with the, I'm not sure his, his exact title, but he's in charge of the program, the industrial design program at Loughborough. And they recently sort of stripped some things back to, to hone in on, on the things that are important, but also to try and take some of the stress away from from the students there because it was extremely difficult i think they they advised a certain number of hours per um uh, per i can't remember the exact term but like per percentage point towards your degree and and when you actually did the maths you were living on about four hours sleep or something so it wasn't actually possible to do the, the amount of hours that they were advising mm -hmm. uh, so to then throw a personal project into that as well um, and at the time I, I wasn't very good at time management. I was terrible at it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not too great at it now, but I'm a lot better than I was. Um, so it, specifically for that case, I wouldn't recommend it. So I'm not by no means, am I, I suggesting that person don't, don't do personal projects. Like mm -hmm. no, do, do personal projects at every opportunity, but don't, if you're in full-time education, don't, don't, um, you know, don't, don't put your degree in danger for the, for the sake of a personal project and don't put your job in danger for the sake of a personal project. Always make time for it though, for sure. Like you're going to have to sacrifice something. So perhaps a social life might, might have to go to the side a little bit and, uh, and things like that. But, but yeah, no, I would definitely advise personal projects, but perhaps not, not in your final year of your degree if yeah, you so, don't have the time. Yeah. So you're more referring to like, you know, like basically be careful of how much you put on your plate um and wherever it may be because it could e equally be like you know you've graduated you're, you're like you're working for a client or working at a company and you want to do a personal project you know basically i guess it's like be prepared to you know have all of your basically be stretched in terms of time resources um yeah. and even health you know you got to keep an eye on that um mm -hmm. and yeah you don't want to burn out basically i mean like I'm I'm 35, so burnout is like a it's a very close friend of mine. You know, we meet each other almost every other day. Um, <laughs> so, but when I was like no, 10 years younger, or even younger than that, that wasn't so much of an issue. Although 
I could look back and think, yeah, I could be a million percent more efficient. And if I made better choices, you know, certain certain things would have come out better perhaps. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I could have guessed I could always rely on, yeah, I can sleep on two, three hours and start again the next day. That is impossible now. Um, so, you know, as, as an old guy, I can definitely relate to it in that sense. Um, but I also can remember what it was like, I guess, you know, graduating and putting all those hours in and stuff. And um, yeah, like, you know, you nailed it in the sense of, I guess, just be wise with your time and make the right choices, which I guess is quite a vague thing to say, because how do you know what right choices to make? But I guess it's like kind of knowing your strengths. Um, yeah. And did you know you could handle that when you were taking on that personal project? Or did you kind of just decide that I'm committed to this and I'm just going to see it through? Yeah, well, I, I must have done. I must have thought that I could handle it. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have done it um, yeah. because I'm not. I'm not too reckless in, right, with things right, like right. that. I definitely wouldn't have jeopardized my degree. So I must have felt like I was. I was okay to do it. But yeah, I guess this. This is personal projects in particular is something that I feel quite strongly about. So perhaps this is something that would be good to get into. Um, for me personally, everything that I've that I have in terms of my career so far has been down to personal projects. So whether that's new clients when I was freelancing or whether it's the role that I have now or the first job out of, out of university, um, I, I attribute all of that to personal projects. So I can't, I can't stress more how, how vital that is. I think in my opinion, um, for, for your self development and, and for your career, honestly, because mm-hmm. a lot of the time, and again, I can't speak for every company and everybody out there, but for me personally, um, you, you're not always going to be able to execute something as purely as you would if you were doing it yourself. If you were doing it for a company, like if you if you're doing if you're doing a, a piece of work for a company, there, there's going to be a lot of people's opinions and, and styles thrown into that mix, right? So, mm-hmm. but when you when you're doing something for yourself, it's there's no design by committee. It's, it's absolutely pure and it's, and it's your vision. And you might not be able to execute it the way that you had in your head um, initially, but, and it might take a couple of years to get to that point, right? But the only way to, to get to that point is through personal projects. And, so, and when doing it, try and, and think about what it is that you're actually trying to achieve by doing this. Mm-hmm. So whether that's, um, you know, maybe I want to learn Blender. So, okay, let, let's think of, of what exactly it is that I want to learn in Blender. So maybe I want to learn how to do hard surface modeling, right? Mm-hmm. And then think about what it is that you feel strongly about, like what kind of design do you want to do? At first, it might be a case of just replicating existing designs, right? That's probably the smart thing to do is to try and not design anything at all, but just try and replicate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then only when you're comfortable with the tools and you, and you feel as though it's an extension of yourself, then you can try and design something. Um, but I think I'm a big advocate for project-based learning. So really trying to achieve something at the end of, of uh, what it is that you're doing, right? So like whether that's a portfolio piece. So, well, yeah, exactly that, actually. Um, if, if you're going to set yourself a personal project. So I've got this, I've got this so backwards, haven't I? No, <laughs> if, no, you set yourself, if you set yourself a goal, then basically apply... Um, a way to do that. So give yourself a project to try and put that goal into. So like I say, if you, if you wanted to learn hard service modeling, then maybe you would figure out how to design a vehicle or, or a mech or a weapon or, or a prop, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or in industrial design terms, perhaps you would, you know, it could be anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but really try and get to a point where you know that this project is going to end because you've achieved what you set out to achieve. And along the way you've learned the tool or the skill that you also set out to, to, to acquire. Um, that are well said. And it's interesting that you mention um, personal project because it is quite obvious. I mean, like even just looking at your Instagram, I believe that is like almost all personal projects, I believe. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and that's something I can relate to as well. Like everything that I have on anything that on my Instagram or my, you know, portfolio, or whatever is purely personal stuff. And um, it's mentioned many times before as well by people who, you know, like are at the heights of the industry or whatever industry you're in, um, especially in the creative field where, you know, like, like Ash Thorpe comes to mind, um, who mention all the time, like they've, they've, you know, I've lost count how many times I've heard him say it, where he's, you know, getting constantly hired for a personal project he has done versus mm-hmm. commercial projects he has done. Um, 
And like you said as well, like, you know, you're in complete control of, um, and back to what you mentioned earlier, it was about being, you, showing your voice. That's the best way to have your voice um, be understood in its most clearest form, right? Like, you know, in, in a project that you have complete control over. Now, obviously, at the same time, I'm sure you'd agree, like when you're working with other fellow professionals and working for like, you know, say like a, a goal for a company, for example, th- th- it's best to have as many voices, obviously the right voices, but the more voices, the better um, to get to that goal, I guess, maybe quicker or in a much more efficient way. Um, and I guess there's definitely more skills related to that. But in terms of nurturing your own vision, your own voice, your own, I guess, skill set, um, can you think of anything better than a personal project? No, no. no. Um, even, even if you've worked at an amazing company on amazing projects, I still think that a personal project is, is really going to do more for you. Um, maybe, maybe I'm not even saying that I probably am, uh, but I do think that I just think that if something has been designed by one person, um, is it's far more, um, evocative than, than anything else. And, and it might be quite, um, it might separate people. It might divide people, which is, which is going to be a good thing. I think if some people really don't like it and some people love it, then you're, you're about right. I would much rather be. I'd much rather have some people like my stuff and some people dislike it than be somewhere in the middle and just have, you know, everyone be like, yeah, that's okay. Um, I think, yeah, but yeah, I think you're right. I think it would do far more for you to have a personal project, a portfolio full of personal projects. I think it's obviously good to demonstrate that you're capable of working as part of a team and that you've actually been able to execute something, um, you know, whether that's through to production or, uh, well, yeah, production in, in the sense of, industrial design and, and entertainment design. I think it's obviously good to, to validate that. But um, yeah, I think I, I much prefer the idea of um, just doing personal projects to show what I'm, what I'm capable of. And, 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 and that leads me on as well to the point of if you really want to be, if you really want to do something, then kind of don't wait for somebody to give you the opportunity to show that you can do it. Just mm-hmm. go ahead and do it for yourself, right? Like set yourself brief. Um, and just do it for the love of it. And eventually you do it enough time. Somebody's going to hire you to do that surely. Um, so, yeah. And that's exactly what you showed in your final year, I guess, pretty much. Obviously you would, you had your goal, you had your task, which was um, given to you, I guess, by the institution that was saying you'd make this project. Um, but at the same time, you know, almost like simultaneously, you were given that same amount of energy towards personal stuff. And, and again, I, I can attest to the fact that I've like being hired just from personal projects like it it is um you know if, if i guess like people are trying to start off or even people who are in the industry just trying to figure out their way we're always i guess looking for formulas right like okay which formula works best i mean you know looking at diets is probably and losing weight is a it's a great example where people are just looking like okay what are the rules what do i follow and how do i do it when in fact if you look into it a little bit deeper it's, it's definitely bespoke to each person you know you either have to tweak things here and there um but you know like the working um personally and doing that kind of stuff is just the way forward um now something you mentioned there about design and it being like you know it can evoke an emotion or it can even like evoke maybe repulsion is a strong word but it can put people off something um Mm -hmm. you know before we get into that topic because that's i guess like you know a topic you could keep talking about forever because it's so subjected to so many opinions around it um Mm -hmm. you know like regarding when you finally graduated and you got that work what was it like being a professional like you know what was did it was it what you expected when you started working for vax what was your i guess daily tasks like um did Mm -hmm. it feel like a job um what was your experience as someone who just gone from student straight professional yeah so i was there for around 18 months and those 18 months were probably some of the most important of my career so far, I would say. Um, and no disrespect to Vax whatsoever, but it was definitely just a job for me. Mm-hmm. I was I was turning up, um, I was doing what was expected of me, and then I would go home and I would I'd probably get home around six. I would eat something and then I would be working till around eleven o'clock or midnight. Mm-hmm. Um, again, just focused solely on um, CGI. So. Yeah, in terms of daily tasks there, I mean, it was very much 
just going through the motions, frankly. Again, no disrespect to Vax, but it was pure product visualization stuff for, you know, our work for packaging, perhaps internal presentations. Again, sometimes it was design validation for the design team. Um, but yeah, it was very, um, well, I mean, it was vacuum cleaners. So yeah, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was, and again, no disrespect to them, but it was, it was very much just a, a job for me. And it, it helped that I really liked the people that, that I worked with. They were so relaxed. We had such a good time there, um, which was, which made it, it made it very difficult to leave when I did leave. But, um, yeah, like I say, I, it was nine to five, I would go home and then I would really focus on, um, CGI and, and I'm trying to actually, in a sense, get back to that point because I wasn't constrained by what it was or who it was that I, that I think I am. I was, I was willing to sort of explore all these different avenues. Um, so, you know, perhaps one day I was figuring out how to create a chocolate shader and then mm -hmm. Maybe not literally the next day, but perhaps the next week I was trying to render a car and, and the week mm -hmm. after it'd be something architectural. So I, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a good thing. I don't think that it's good to just completely bounce around, but it was so early um, in my career that I didn't, I didn't know any better. And looking back, it was, it was an opportunity for me to, to really figure a lot of things out. And, and a lot of the stuff that I learned in those 18 months um, in my free time, I'm using today on a daily basis. Right, right. Um, and I say that I'm trying to get back to that point. I'm not trying to get back to the point of bouncing around from one thing to the next, but I'm trying to get back to the point of being free to uh, create things that I want to create mm -hmm. based purely on instinct, right? Mm -hmm. So the things, again, this goes back to um, trying to relate back to my childhood um, and the things that I really cared about. I'm trying to sort of lean into that and, and do things that are going to make me happy as opposed to thinking, okay, what is, what is the smartest thing to do next? Mm. Um, I really, I'm trying to remove the shackles a little bit and, and allow myself to create things that I've wanted to create and, and had in mind for, you know, the past few years. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's quite obvious and I'm sure you'd agree as well, um, that the fusion between what is your career and what's a hobby is you can't, I guess, it's the same mm -hmm. thing, I guess, right? Like, you know, it's yeah, it's pretty much that's, the a, same that's thing. a tricky one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and it's hard to um it's hard to explain that to people that aren't um necessarily creative or, or working in the industry because if so a good example would be, you know, if my dad rang me at ten o'clock at night and asked me, or maybe not ten o'clock, but maybe halfway through um yeah. halfway through a football match or something, or soccer for our cousins across the pond. Yeah. Um <laughs> And he would ask me what I'm doing if I'm watching the game. And I'd say, yeah, I've got it, you know, I've got it on whilst, whilst I'm working, you know, maybe it's half nine or something. He's like, why, why are you working at half nine? And it's not, it's because it's not, it doesn't feel like work, right? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. it, it is like you said, it is both a hobby and a job. And we're just fortunate enough that they're one in the same. Um, and, and there is a separation there, of course, between your day job and, and your personal work. If you are constantly working on personal projects, mm -hmm. it is, it is relaxing and it's fulfilling and you can, you can go to bed and you have a good night's sleep knowing that you've, you've taken a step closer to completing a project or mm -hmm. learning a new tool or whatever it may be. It's, it's satisfying in, in a way that I'd never experienced before, um, you know, growing up, there was, there's looking back in hindsight, there's a frustration there. As, as a teenager, as not being able to, to execute the things that I have in my mind, right? And then yeah. not being able to, um, not having that creative outlet. And, and, and I didn't realize that as a kid. And it's only now I look back and I'm like, well, yeah, of course, of course you were that frustrated because you've not got what you've got now. Like if you had what you have now, you would, you would be so much more relaxed, right? Yep. Um, but yeah, the, you're, you're completely right. I think that there is no real separation between between um your personal work and and your well the, sorry there's a separation between your personal work and your day job but it's all it's all work and you love it all the same um so so yeah i, I think i i feel very grateful that i'm in that kind of position and and i wish it for everybody right yes, but it's yes. difficult it's difficult to get there but once you know what it feels like you, you just want everybody to be able to experience that mm -hmm. I, I totally concur and 
with my like I guess people in my inner circle and people that I interact with who I guess not creative I do come across very preachy sometimes in that sense like you know you just gotta like you gotta do what you love why are you not doing it you don't realize how awesome it is like it can be done um, because I've spoken to many I, I was stuck in since I graduated I was stuck in like and I say stuck and I'm being quite critical of an industry that did teach me a lot of skills that I believe I could not have gathered elsewhere even in the creative industry um, but because yeah. it wasn't what I wanted to do there's always that kind of frustration um, I was stuck in like a sales industry for like you know close to 15 years or beyond um, although that was happening before uni kind of you know that was making me money so I had to kind of stay there until you know the career kind of took off um, but the amount of people I ended up speaking to who are kind of in a similar boat who maybe things didn't take off how it was supposed to be as planned um, like some of them were musicians some were into other things some you know like very different kind of ventures but you could you could relate to that passion that, you know like you know like you were talking about design and just wanting to create and explore new avenues it's that same energy but it manifests in you know like I got a friend who's very much into cars and like you know restoring mm-hmm. them building them and customizing them and things that i don't understand but you could just i could recognize the passion um yeah. again people are into music and all these are the passions that you see people say oh, that's what i'm into it, almost like to the point where it's not even their hobby anymore um but they're kind yeah. of into it they they kind of you know kind of like live it through watching others do it or just like you know hey i'm just going to check this out but it's yeah I, I, you know just to go back to what we're talking about like i do get to that same point as well where like you know you can still do it but then at the same time it's that balance of life because um one thing that i definitely struggle with is i'm like yourself like if i had the time i would be doing something that's linked to what my passions are my interests are um it's always mm-hmm. creative but yeah. at the same time like you know regarding my family and time for the kids and other responsibilities i have it eats into that which is equally could be detrimental in that aspect so it's kind of like for me it's like figuring out a balance of it and holding back I guess that frustration when you know you kind of can't like like, as kids when the kid can't play they kind of you know throw their toys at the pram and um get annoyed and even as a creative now it's still still like that um but like have you experienced that yourself in you know like has it ever burnt you where um you are working on this like you said till till 10 p.m um and i'm the same Mm -hmm. as well like a lot of the stuff that i'm also into like sports and other things they tend to be watched on a separate screen alongside me um creating um but yeah uh, i'm sure you got any some stories or like close to even like being burnt by that and i guess some some of the downsides of being i guess um not to put words in your mouth but being consumed by this this you know creative force yeah and (sighs) It's, it's hard for me to say that there's a huge amount of sacrifice involved. Um, that, that is the truth. But whenever I come around to this and I think about what it was that I did sacrifice in order to, you know, put more time into this and, and do the things that I've done so far, um, I think about what the alternative was. And the alternative was to not do the things that I've done so far and not put as much time into it, which is far worse than anything that's happened, you know. So it's always, it's always going to be a balancing act and you obviously don't want to ruin relationships and you don't want to sacrifice time with family and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's, and you mentioned it before, it's different for everybody. It depends on your circumstances, you know, how far away from your family do you live? Like how often are you seeing them anyway? Mm. Uh, whether or not you're single, whether or not you have kids, how, um, how demanding is your day job? There are so many factors that it's, you can't just give, uh, a blanket statement piece of advice for everybody. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um, but, but yeah, there, there's definitely been times where I've had to ruin relationships because of um, my devotion to what it is that I do. Mm-hmm. And, and the way that I look at it, not to be disrespectful to um, my friends or, or, uh, you know, people from previous relationships and things, but um, they're just not, they're, then they're just not the right people for you, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and it goes for family as well. Like I know you can't, you can't pick your family, but, um, you have to do what's right for you. Ultimately, there has to be a level of of selfishness with this. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's not a very, that might not be a very popular comment, but, but it's true. And I'm not saying be a selfish person, but it's, it's okay to give yourself something. It's okay 
for you to dedicate the amount of time that you need to dedicate something in order to achieve what it is that you want to achieve. And that might be sacrificing time with your friends or and loved ones. Um, but no, but you don't have to do that completely. Like always make time. Like I'll go for a walk with my mom around the park for half an hour every, mm-hmm. every few days. And that can be enough. Right. Um, so yeah. And there are definitely times where I've been burned. And I, I mentioned the, the time that I lived in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Um, that was quite demanding and definitely put a lot of strain on uh, my relationship there at the time. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I don't regret any of it because if you're happy where you are now, then it's, it's really hard to regret too much that's happened in the past. Right. Um, and, and again, I, I always ask myself what the alternative was and it was to whether or not to, to sacrifice the things that I'm really passionate about um, or, or, or to not. Right. And I, and, and I'm happy with where I'm at so far. I, I I'm hoping that I'm not, coming across as some egocentric maniac when I'm saying this stuff, but it, but it, but I just want to, to say that it is okay to be a little bit selfish sometimes when it comes to this stuff, like to dedicate the time and, and not to feel guilty about doing that when your friends, you know, ask you to do something and perhaps you, you have to say no a couple of times. It's not, it's okay. You know, um, maybe you, you don't want to completely alienate yourself from your friends, but, um, so I think you mentioned it, you know, there's definitely a balance to be struck uh, and I wouldn't advise completely showing yourself out from the outside world, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, to put a lot, to put the time that you need into doing something depending on how much you really want it is, um, is, is going to be key. Now, I mean, like just to back what you just mentioned a second ago, like, I don't think that is coming across as egocentric at all. If anyone does, please put in the comments below. Um, now, but all jokes aside... <laughs> Um, you know, like it for me. That's, that's, that's me not reading the comments. <laughs> um, no, but for me personally, like I've I've done both. Um, I've done the both where I've kind of like sacrificed my art career because thinking that this is going to be beneficial for family and you know there's other factors involved regarding that as well. But I've done both, and ultimately, like you mentioned before, by going full circle, it kind of led me to the point where no, I need to be way more selfish with my art stuff because it's there's there's that that kind of like. I don't know if it's a noise or a voice or that urge, it just never goes away. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's like, then you go in that side and it goes full circle, well, not full circle, but it, you know, it kind of tilts the other way um, mm-hmm. where personal relationships and friendships and even like, you know, relationships with family members and even just like this normal stuff you would do before starts to, sometimes it can be quite abrupt and quite explosive when it just ends. Sometimes it just erodes away. Um, yeah. But, at the same time, it kind of like does show and highlight you, uh, whichever side you go, whether it's like, you know, putting your passion to one side and focusing on relationships and responsibilities you may have or vice versa. Um, whichever path you're following along, they will cross over in my, my experience, but it will kind of highlight those mainstays in your life, those things that you could say are non-negotiable that kind of have to be given attention, uh, yeah. things that you can't get rid of. Um, but also I believe the right phrase is who your actual ride or dies are like you know the people that who are I guess perhaps worth your time and you realize that your time is very worth a lot has a lot of worth for them as well um, mm-hmm. and I guess it's more gone on to like you know not so much philosophical but I guess the human aspect of being a designer because perhaps anyone who's a creative and this is not just going for the design and the art realm this could be a chef this could be a musician this could be an you know anyone who creates something um, of any type is maybe we kind of looked at like just machines just things that create these awesome things they're yeah. consumed make some more this is great and the human aspect kind of does go away maybe even for the creator themselves it's like i'm just meant to constantly do this um and then obviously sometimes that can fall apart sometimes it doesn't um and i guess it's going to be it's cool that th- and just to go back on what we mentioned before i guess the ultimate thing is balance is one and just be aware of this kind of stuff as well because i'm sure you've had it too where you know that the blinkers come on you know you definitely have um i forgot the phrase now but basically you just fixated on your goal and nothing yeah. else exists um but then you realize you look back and there's a trail of destruction um <laughs> but you know that's obviously that's quite an exaggeration um um, but that's interesting as well because in that yeah point, i get, I get yeah, your point yeah. though yeah and and there's 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 just so many pieces to this mm-hmm. puzzle, isn't there? There's, there's so many things that need to be taken into account because you, I mean, just, just to even put 
time into the thing that you love in, in itself is dis- is difficult, right? So it requires discipline. It requires mm. proper planning. It requires, the, well, obviously ability. Or if you if you have a lack of understanding of what it is that you need to do, then you need to put time into learning the tools before you can actually execute something. But then on yeah, but then on the other side of things with with family and friends and uh, relationships and things like that. Um, I mean, I, for me personally. I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have uh, such a, a supportive family. Um, oh, nice. From for the long, for as long as I can remember, it's always been a case of, you know, we'll, we'll support you whatever you want to do. Um, and and in more recent times, they it, the the amount of time that I've put into this stuff has, has um, increased and it's become more intense. And and they're still understanding about it. There's there's been a few you know uh, conversations that we've all had to have and we've made changes, but. That, but that's all it takes, right? And I'm also very fortunate to be in a relationship with somebody that's also extremely supportive and an understanding of, of what it is mm. uh, that I do and that I want to do in the future. Um, so I get there's, there's an element. Yes, you, you need to you need to put the time into the things that matter, but also there's an element of uh, you you need to create a system of support that yes. works for you, and not even just in terms of people, but your environment, you know, perhaps where you live, uh, or, or is everything in the same place that you left it the day before, so that you can stay in some kind of routine, right? Because locking yourself into into a creative job isn't, you know, as I'm sure you and, and a lot of the people listening understand, it can be sometimes difficult to just switch it on if you're not feeling it. Um, yes. And so, trying to reduce the number of variables throughout every day is is something that's really important to me so i'll have the same routine when i get up every day and mm-hmm. it all it's the same thing every single day until the point where i sit at my desk and then i know okay that everything everything that needed to be done is done and now i can focus the rest of the day on what it is that i've got to do so like i say there's, there's so many pieces of the puzzle and they're perhaps not all the same pieces for everybody you've got to figure out what works for you and, and try and stick to it right um for sure, for sure. but yeah and um yeah not 100 percent agree like routine or just like get like you know getting yourself let's just say you're a boxer trying to get ready for a fight whatever your pre-fight ritual is or your pre-match ritual is just go through that just to get yourself in the zone do you gotta do and then whatever you gotta do after that as well um i just wanted to make a quick point on what you mentioned before about being selfish that's something that i kind of like still struggle with today but had to learn the hard way as well is like you know um I, i get what you mean when you say that because it does sound like, you know, it's, it's a greedy word, right? Like, you know, it's linked to greed almost when you say yeah. the word selfish. It's like, oh, you're not giving something back or you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. Um, but ultimately, um, just from my personal experience, and I'm sure many other people can relate to this as well, is a case of sometimes, you know, you do kind of neglect, I guess, your passion and what you want to do and just even neglect your time and realise that, okay, or we kind of maybe miss underestimate the kind of time that we need to create something um, or do something yeah. or achieve something or develop something and um, just just ensuring that you lock off that time give yourself the maximum that you can do in that time um, and then yeah yeah, just, just achieve it um, but um, you, another thing you mentioned as well was tools and obviously one of the reasons why I mentioned that um, it sounds like and obviously you confirmed that as well that it's definitely a blend of hobby and career or maybe it's just a hobby that has a career element to it um mm-hmm. but like you know you mentioned in your final year you were um working on personal projects and you mentioned it was a fact of you know like using 3d and visualization side of things and more the cgi aspect and my uni course it was almost exactly the same obviously industrial design it's it's yeah. very similar it's a spectrum but it's very similar in terms of the process uh, a lot of these different um i guess avenues in the industry create or at least we were taught to create which is a case of like you mentioned, research, which is quite common anyway, but then it's like, you know, ideate, sketch, refine that sketch. And then when you're happy with certain things or you've frozen it, then you take it into the visualization aspect, whether that would have been traditional 3D, obviously with cars, it would have been automotive clay. Um, or if you took it to yeah. 3D, for us, it was Alias, um, which is great surfacing yeah. to our, Daniel Simon uses that. Or I don't know if he still does, but he did when he made Cosmic Motors. Um, but for me, that was like, whoa, this is super difficult. I want to stick to sketching. Fast forward to today, I'm completely opposite. I, everything's almost done in 3D, um, but similar to and yourself. Do you, do you still use Alias? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, okay. Um, in my final year, the final two years, I was introduced to Maya, again, polymodeling. Um, yep. And that changed everything because that seemed more intuitive. 
Um, although uh, I used Fusion 360 a lot, which I think is a nice blend between both in terms of Alias and um, Maya, because you got that polymering aspect if you want to go down, down that route. You got that surfacing aspect if you want to go down that route as well. Um, yeah. So it's kind of got a nice blend of both. But ultimately, um, similar to yourself, it was like kind of like that poly modeling and then realizing how do I get this to look awesome with rendering and stuff. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, not to make this about myself, but um, flash forward no, to no, it's a, interesting. a few years ago where it was a case of like, how do I kind of make this into a career that the skills that I have, I'm not, it's not going to be getting anywhere. How do I figure this out? Discovered Learn Square, discovered um, a few courses there and then realized that, oh shit, you don't need to do all these steps that I was taught. It's not as rigid. Um, yeah. And my brain is a bit different or is a bit oh, uh, malfunction sometimes in the sense of if I'm showed, a, and so I've been, since I've been a kid, if I'm showed a certain process, I will follow it until I figure out a different process, which takes a lot longer or I'm showed a, di or I'm showed a different process. So I was always kind of like following those steps that I got taught at uni. Um, then when I found out these new steps where he goes, you can skip all of this. You're not still not creating. You're just doing it in a concentrated place, like you're doing all in maybe 3D or, or digital, and you can still achieve awesome results. That was like, mm -hmm. you know, hey, that was awesome. Why did I not realize this before? Um, yeah. But yeah, um, by the way, I'm sure you've noticed a trend with me in the podcast is I have these long monologues before I get to a question. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Is um, So where where did this kind of like need to develop new tools? Or I guess like, you know, it's more the interest of like, oh, well, this is cool. How do I kind of maximize this to the way I want to use it? When did yeah. that start becoming a thing for you? Yeah, so I think, so my first real introduction to, to 3D was um, in the first week or so of university, which was a CAD program called, um, at the time it was called Creo. Mm. Uh, I think it might, maybe it is still called 3O, uh, Creo, sorry. But um, before that, I think it was perhaps called Proe. Some people yeah. might know, know it as that, but it's a, a CAD package. And at the, at the time it was notoriously difficult to learn. And the idea was that if you can learn this CAD package, then you'll know any of the CAD packages that packages that are available to you when you go into industry. So whether it be SolidWorks or Fusion 360 or Siemens NX, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. if you learn Creo, you you're going to set yourself up to to know these are the CAD packages. And there was probably some truth to that because I've used SolidWorks since and I learned Fusion 360 fairly mm -hmm. comfortably. Um, there isn't a huge amount of difference between them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was my first real introduction. To, to 3D and also uh, Keyshot not too long after that. And it was only recently actually that I was looking back at some of the work that I did in my first year, which is coming up to about, uh, would it be? Not not quite 10 years yet, mm -hmm. but almost 10 years, which is a scary thought. <laughs> but, um, and and yeah, it's quite, uh, I'm probably not, I'm probably not going to send it to you anyway. Let's put it that way. <laughs> enough, no, it's, it's not great. It's um, NFT one day. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, in terms of, of tools, though, I, I think we can get hung up on tools, can't we? Quite, quite easily. Yes. So, like, you you can have a pretty solid um, foundation. So, for example, I use 3ds Max, V-Ray, um, which are both obviously very capable. Uh, I use Keyshot sometimes for rendering too. Um, and I use both Fusion 360 and Moi for CAD modeling. Mm -hmm. um, and but you can quite easily, you know, look at somebody else's work and you know go searching through the hashtags to find whatever it is whatever you know CAD package or or, um, or or rendering engine they're using to to create their work. And and you can make you not so much anymore, but definitely in the early days, it makes you want to jump ship and then and pick up whatever tool they're using, mm -hmm. right? Because you you assign too much credit to the tool, uh, which mm -hmm. is why I think you get you get to a point where that question really, really bugs you. And it's the same, I'm sure, the typical one in the entertainment industry, right, is uh, what, what brush are you using or something yes, like yes. that. Um, I've, I've per personally never had that question, but uh, right. I've definitely <laughs> had, I've definitely had what render and what, what render and yes, I yes, used. Yes. Um, and it, Earlier on, it's not it's not such a big deal because you're kind of naive yourself in thinking that the the tool is doing the work for you, mm -hmm. and and in some case I can I can understand that right. But as as time goes on, it, I can understand why it's frustrating because some people might 
be essentially crediting whatever tools you're using to the result that you mm-hmm. that you that you've yeah, got yeah um and and it's not very fair because you need to understand how to use the tool in order to to execute whatever it is that, that's in your head or whatever it is that you've sketched down um so yeah i think we we assign too much credit to the render engine but i mean there are there are some legit uh reasons as to why you might want to switch right so like i i'm learning blender at the moment but just because of uh the the trajectory for blender at the moment as i'm sure you'll know it just seems insane it feels like every week some somebody's developed a new plugin that is just a a huge game changer and then um the blender foundation themselves are, are implementing some crazy crazy stuff so it feels like a tool and not to mention the fact that it's free right compared to yes. the, the to the price of of autodesk products or um i think cinema 4d is a little bit cheaper but even so um open source not uh, on top of all the crazy features that, that they have going on it, it seems like a tool that would be worth investing in but i don't see it drastically changing the way that i do things or the results that i get i just think that um that is a very future safe tool to be using Mm -hmm. and it's the same with something like unreal engine right like unreal engine unless you compare it to something like unity is just a tool all of its own that you Mm -hmm. can't even compare to the likes of v-ray or keyshot because it's just not the same thing it's not the same experience you you might be able to compare it to like Eevee for Blender, mm-hmm. but uh, from what I've seen and heard of Eevee, it's not it's not quite there yet, especially compared to something like Unreal Engine, which is understandable. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, and and again, so if if you liked somebody's work, um, I think I'm hope I hope I'm not mispronouncing mispronouncing his name, but uh, David Bayless, I think is his name, is doing mm-hmm. some crazy crazy stuff um in, in unreal engine and so it's like if you asked him what render engine he was using and he turned around and he said unreal engine and you're using keyshot or octane or whatever and you decided that you wanted to try unreal engine based on his work that wouldn't be um something outlandish right like that wouldn't be a ridiculous reason to switch mm-hmm. to unreal engine because mm-hmm. again the the trajectory for unreal engine seems insanely good so yeah, there there are gray areas with stuff like that. But if I use 3ds Max and V-Ray, and I know that someone like uh, Carlos Color Sponge uses mm-hmm. Cinema 4D, I know he uses 3ds Max as well. But yeah. for the sake of argument, he he uses Cinema 4D and Corona, and I I, I say that I'm going to switch to to that because I see the amazing results that he's getting. Yeah, that's essentially me saying the reason that he's getting those results, and I'm not is because he's using this software which is just Mm -hmm. not not true whatsoever not to mention the fact that he was using and still does every now and again as far as i'm aware 3ds max and v-ray so it's it's down to him you know he's an incredible artist and and designer yes um and so i the tools are one thing and obviously they're very important but how you use them is is far Mm -hmm. far more important you can find insane artists and designers that use any any piece of software and you'll be blown away by it yeah for sure um and I'm glad that you kind of, the way you articulated that, the way you did, I think it's a perfect way um, to explain, I guess, this particular topic. And I'm sure you'd agree, the that main topic of like render engine and whatever package it may be or tools or whatever, that is usually someone who's starting off, someone who's completely unfamiliar or maybe is seasoned in one particular field, but not in this particular lane that you're in and wants to maybe switch. So, you know, it's quite a common question of like, oh, um, and because our stuff is kind of like it's blurry in the sense of like you know it isn't, like you can't really pinpoint what it is that makes an artist great in terms of like a particular trait so you can see what tools they're using and think oh that's probably the reason why Um, you know yeah. t- before digital age it was and there is a kind of like you know there there is logic in it Um, in terms of like the type of pencils and the you know the kind of mm-hmm. papers that you use the markers etc but that doesn't make your design great. That's just more like a, a choice for the artist, right? Um, but like, yeah, so yeah. I think the way I've reasoned with it in terms of, because um, I used to be there too, like thinking when I first started Alias, um, there were other students rendering awesome stuff. And I don't know if you remember, or if it stopped by them, but it was Bunk Speed, um, which was like yeah. basically the I, I never, 
I never got to use it, but I have I have heard about uh, yeah being the predecessor to Keyshot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, back back to another Daniel Simon. I'm definitely Daniel Simon fanboy. Um, mm-hmm. That's what he used um, yeah. on some of his renders as well. Um, well, that's part of his pipeline. Um, but then also it was kind of like, oh, but you're not cool unless you can build the shaders yourself within Alias or whatever it might be. Um, so there's always that kind of like, you know, um, but I guess it's like which, which kind of, let's say you got those, you know, RPG games, what kind of class of, you know, warrior do you want to be? And then you kind of got to yeah. develop that skill set. Um, you're not always going to get the skill set of the other class, but you just got to go with whatever you decide. Um, and I guess it's more so yeah. about, um, that's more like a beginner talk. And then when you realize that, oh, it's not about the package, it's about the things of like your theory, your understanding of the fundamentals, and then mm-hmm. being able to extract that and combine it with your imagination and all that kind of stuff. And then add the professional side to it, like that's the next stage. And when you start thinking of that, that's kind of know that your career is progressing how it should. Whereas maybe if you're still latched onto or stuck on what, tool is my favorite artist using then maybe there's still a more that you still got more to go more ways to go to develop before yeah. you are reaching that um but then with that said you know like there's always that gear porn like we always love hearing about um even till this day like i'm saying that right now but then i'm also curious like you know to hear what tools you're using and how you're using them not because i'm not, you know just to get that insight in terms of oh cool that's interesting mm. um yeah. or how you're doing that um and then like say with um geeking out on things like films and all that kind of stuff, like always oh, at this thing of, oh, I wonder yeah. what camera they use, what lens they use. It has no yeah. difference in terms of how cool that film was. It's just that like, oh, I found that cool. Oh, that's interesting. They achieved that look with this X, Y, and Z. Um see, I'm speaking too many Americans. I keep saying Z. Um Z. Z, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Z and Zbrush. Um <laughs> so you know, it, it is cool. And I it's kind of like balancing that out with like yeah, the gears, it's cool because it's exciting. It's like, you know the one very laid out there's a lot of cool things that can be achieved in there but it isn't what makes your yeah, art awesome yeah you're completely right and and context definitely matters um and i think you've already you've already said this or alluded to it at least but like if you are if you are a beginner um is it's, it's a strange one isn't it so let's say for example like you are an absolute beginner you've never picked up uh, a 3d package before asking the question what 3d software do you use is a very relevant question, right? Like you, you need to know where to start and what the mm-hmm. best what the best tool might be for somebody who is a complete artist. In which case, you would suggest something like Blender, right? It's free and, and there's plenty of learning materials out there. And by the way, like the amount of learning material and how good the manual is for a piece of software, I feel like is such an undervalued mm. um, part of picking a piece of software that you're going to use. That uh, learning materials is a massive one for me because if there's nothing out there and then the software is really old and, and all the all the tutorials are from like you know 2002 or whatever <laughs> then it can be extremely difficult you're making yeah. life hard for yourself uh but then it gets to a point where okay so if you've learned if you already know a 3d package and perhaps you're a year into your career if you're if you're then asking people what what tool they're using you're thinking about switching because you're not getting the results that you want um that then becomes um a bit of an irrelevant question. Again, I can I can completely, as you've said, sympathize why that is a question. Mm-hmm. But I think that that's the wrong question to be asking. Yeah. And then eventually, when you're way way further down the line, and you're and you're very you know, um, you 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 understand the software pretty well, and and you know roughly what it is that that you're doing. Um, the the question might become relevant again if you're able to understand the intricacies of of your tool and you understand its downfalls then asking questions around a different piece of software and whether that is a genuine improvement over the tool that you're using right now then the question becomes relevant again Mm -hmm. so it is it is a weird one so i can i can definitely see it from 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 both perspectives now that i think about it um um, so just jump in but like i guess one thing is this is definitely the digital creative space so ultimately it's about if you are starting completely fresh just ultimately it, it makes sense to put the time in to do the research in terms of um what gear people use in terms of like maybe not just the software but like the different varieties of software um mm-hmm. and ultimately what is really going to decide it for you is the price um i mean like we've in um going back to like industrial design path a lot of the stuff back then and even still now but like say 10 years ago even more um very expensive 
Like I know Autodesk did the student stuff, but if there yeah. wasn't that available, like, you know, you're talking three, four grand, uh, I think for a year. And that's only yeah. just the, the, the package, not the render engine, which was always separate. And then, you know, like you look at, um, then obviously the, the, the PC or the laptop you're looking to get, uh, if you want to get a Wacom tablet, all those kind of things, it all adds up. Yet, if you can put that money maybe into your hardware and realize that I can just get started in Blender and realize that I can make everything I kind of need to do in something that's free. You mentioned Unreal Engine, that's also free. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, um, and this works in other disciplines as well, like maybe photography, um, even cooking, all these things that if you really go into it, shit can get very, very expensive in terms of tools and, you know, the kind of things that you want to get. But ultimately, it always goes back on if you can't get the most out of it in the first place, do you need to? And all of those things that I mentioned have a basic fundamental core, I guess, like way of working that you kind of need to grasp before you even venture out into experimenting with the different types of stuff and workflow um, in the first place. And I guess like same with that industry, it is cool because there's also that, there's also those uncharted territory that's always further ahead. You mentioned Unreal Engine earlier. Um, like yeah. that—that's an emerging thing. I mean, like it's a game engine, but in the industrial design realm, um, at least like the, the visualization potential of it is is awesome. Like just popping your design in there and then being able to you know kick out animations or um, renders and that kind of stuff all in real time, or even send it to a client that can explore their product that they've asked you to create in real time. That is super powerful versus how it yeah. used to be done back then. So it does make sense to kind of like at the same time have that you know um that itch to kind of experiment with new workflows and all that kind of stuff um but yeah something that we we definitely see a lot of at learn squared is there's always that and it is mainly beginners and shout out to the beginners because we've all got to start from somewhere and it's cool that you're curious for um, sure, for but sure. there's always that thing of like, what software do i use or even like when you see 50 different ways to do one thing it's like which way do you begin um and even back to like products like let's say you're just trying to buy you know a phone for the first time do i get an iphone do i get a samsung what do i get and mm -hmm. then there's all these different kind of like opinions of this should be this it should be this it should be this almost like they're matter of fact when in fact they're just subjective it, it can be a minefield um yeah. but yeah i guess my, my personal i'm sure you'd agree as well it's a case of if you can get something that's free um start off with that first and then slowly build up afterwards yeah, if you can, if there's a way for you to minimize risk, then that should always yes. be the route as a beginner. Um, so it is, it's unquestionable at this point that if if you want to learn 3D as a complete beginner, having never used any 3D package before, Blender is 100% the thing that you should be using. I don't see how any other package offers anything more mm. than Blender for what a beginner needs. I, mm. I really don't. Um, and so, yeah, minimizing risk is the big one. You don't want to invest a, an insane amount of money to find out that it's not actually yeah. something you're interested in, right? Or it's not something you're gonna you're gonna stick to. And and with the the power of, uh, you know, even just a typical PC or or a Mac or, or whatever these days can handle Blender just fine. At least you know for modeling. Um, so and and that would really be where I would begin mm -hmm. is, is learning how to model. It might not be great for rendering you know but that that feels like a, a, a different ball game mm -hmm. um but to at least just figure out whether or not you like it i think that a typical pc or a mac could handle blender and you can you know just mm -hmm. have a play around with it follow a few tutorials and and again that, that for me is probably the second most important thing as i've mentioned is the amount of learning material especially yes. as a beginner if you can find a great youtube channel or a course or something that you really like the look of and you're going to find, because you have to enjoy it, right? Like if, if yes, you yes, yes. enjoy the presenter or, or whoever it is that's teaching you, um, that, that's a big thing too. So yeah, as you mentioned, the cost, I would say, is the number one thing, minimizing risk and, um, and the amount of le learning material that there is out there. So again, and, and Blender checks both those boxes. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a Blender ambassador and I barely even know the software Dude, myself. Dude, I but... think with Blender <laughs> itself, the way that it's done this like black magic over everybody, even if like, I would say I'm a Blender ambassador, but I keep mentioning it as a recommended tool. And obviously yeah. I'm not like, you know, the, there's definitely like a very passionate um, Blender fan base out there. And rightly so, but um, yeah. it's just logical, you know, in that sense. Like it does, For sure. like if, if I had this when I started off at uni and stuff like, oh my God, the, the possibilities would have been amazing. 
Like I remember just being so confused and not even confused thinking, oh, you know, I need to wait until I get X amount of how much I need to be able to purchase this or get this or get that. Um, now that, you know, like, and even then it was kind of like not proven because it was all about that's what they use in the industry. So that's what you need. That was always the pitch, right? Um, yeah. Now it's almost like there's no, at least in the concept art space, there's no such thing as you need this to be in the industry. You just need that knowledge and that be able to, like I mentioned about your personal work before, like be able to extract your imagination to create your voice and show mm-hmm. the world what you're capable of. And then that will get you hired. Um, but that's yeah, and that and yeah, that's okay. the thing that I really, really love about the entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. Um, not that not that I have any experience in it whatsoever, but from uh, from what I've seen, um, that that seems to be the theme. Is you, you see people all the time getting jobs that perhaps don't have a traditional art degree or mm-hmm. um, VFX degree or whatever. So long as you have a portfolio or a reel, or you're able to demonstrate that you can do the job. Um, then you'll you'll likely get a job somewhere mm-hmm. um, if you know if your work's good enough. Just whether, regardless of whether or not you have a degree studying mm-hmm. that thing, which is something that I would love to see um, the industrial design industry really adopt. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would love to see companies and agencies begin to take on people that are quite clearly capable of doing the job and understand the uh, what's necessary. To, to be able to put, to design a product, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if they're able to to demonstrate that, I, I don't see why you shouldn't be at least given the opportunity, um, regardless of whether or not you have a degree. Now, that mm-hmm. being said, I'm, that's not me saying that um, degrees aren't worth anything. Like my, I can only speak to my degree, and, and um, I feel very grateful that I went to a university where I left with very tangible skills right Mm -hmm. so obviously i left with a degree but more importantly than that i left with a skill set that i don't Mm -hmm. feel i would have been able to get anywhere else so how how somebody might go about doing that right now i'm I'm not entirely sure um but yeah it would it would be great to to see um the the product design and industry industrial design industry take on that kind of approach And and we're sharing tools now as well which is great um, you know, we're seeing more and more industrial designers and automotive designers pick up something like Blender. So mm-hmm. there's, there's, we're starting to come around to it um, for sure. But uh, it, like, it would be great to see it taken a, a step further. That's interesting. That's actually going to be my next question related to, you know, like, is it that same kind of vibe within the industrial design space? Um, but even like, say, with tools, because obviously, like I mentioned before, like regarding concept art, if you just want to start out, just pick up Blender and then let it evolve from there, whichever way your skill set will be. Um, but what would you say regarding industrial design and product design and like the, the visualization aspect of things? Um, are there certain go-to tools that you think you kind of you kind of cannot get away with? Like for example, in the digital space, you can't do this without a computer or some <coughs> excuse me <coughs> or some kind of you know like. A tablet of some space uh of some kind um so like what are kind of like the go-to tools um to kind of do the stuff that you do for a beginner yeah probably not too dissimilar to mm. somebody trying to get into the entertainment space um a, a good machine you know it doesn't have to be anything crazy but it needs to be something that can handle a cad package and mm-hmm. uh you know, even maybe even a, a poly modeling package at this point, but obviously rendering as well. Um, in terms of go-to tools, I mean, in terms of CAD packages, there there's so many of them, and none of them are, uh, a, you know, the gold standard. Right. Agencies across the country and well across the, across the world use uh, a crazy amount of different CAD packages. Um, like you mentioned, Alias before. So I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to go into what tools specifically we mm-hmm. use uh, at arrival, but we use a wide range of them and they're all very capable. Alias definitely being one of them for, you know, that A-class surfacing. Um, but yeah, I think, so Fusion 360 would be a good one. You mentioned mm-hmm. that. There's a, I think there's a student license of that. Um, Keyshot is, is a weird one for me personally. I think it's very, you would, you would think that it would be approachable for students. Um, mm. And, and hobbyists, but it's actually pretty expensive 
yes. compared to other compared to other render engines, which is why even for rendering, I would guide somebody down the Blender view at this yeah, point yeah, yeah. as well. Um, so it, it's it's very doable. I understand that you there's an upfront cost of, of getting a PC or a Mac, um, but even that in itself, if you're able to afford it, of course, um, you have to see that as an investment, and you'll very quickly get that return on investment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again, goes back to minimizing risk. Fusion 360, there's a student license that you can get for free, and Blender for rendering and even poly modeling. Those two, those two tools alone would do so much good as an industrial designer. Mm -hmm. um, because we're even seeing, and obviously a, a pen and paper as well. Let's not forget that, right? Like there's plenty of people just of course, still, yes. still still, trying to get ideas down onto paper and out of their head as quickly as they can. Me personally, I, I feel that I'm way more efficient in 3D, so I, I'll mm. do a rough 3D sketch is, is essentially how I think of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, I, I think it's quite, it's quite approachable for a beginner trying to, get into industrial design again mm. it's it's a it's a bit of a weird one because there's so much to it right with design yeah. for manufacture and um cmo so uh materials colors and finishes uh, there's a there's a lot to it that i would personally struggle right now as a beginner to learn off the internet for example there's no real central location mm. um not yet anyway and um yeah but it, i think there's there's a lot of crossover between the entertainment industry and product oh, design for sure for uh, sure and i think that's like in a, in a cool way as well um obviously there's like you know there's um definitely like in terms of tool how tools are used definitely a crossover and you know like it's quite famously um on the entertainment side we tend to use tools that are ne not necessarily meant for the industry like initially like mache is a great example of fusion 360 um mm -hmm. it was never i'm sure it had have been but it was never like kind of structured and built in the way like it was never supposed to be oh we're just gonna you know do the kind of stuff that you could do in 3ds max and maya it was all supposed to be like its own different thing um yeah i, saw yeah, that I believe fact. i believe it was actually mache that not that i know mache personally but there was i think maybe a learn squared live stream with mache and uh grant warwick yep. if you know grant Warwick. Yep. again i don't know grant personally mm -hmm. but i was um I was learning V-Ray through a lot of his courses. Mm. So when I saw that he was on Learn Squared po podcast with Mache, I think Mache was showing him Fusion 360 and how how much um, how great of a tool it was, and and, yes. and how much easier it would be to model this thing that Grant was trying to model um, if if only he knew a CAD package. So I think I actually it was Mache that uh, that introduced me to uh, to Fusion 360. Uh, same. It was the same thing of like, oh, cool, like this. Because um, when I first discovered Lens Squared, obviously the live stream has just started, and he mentioned Fusion, and I googled it, and what came up first was the um, the free version of Nuke, I believe. So I was thinking, what? This can do that? And I downloaded oh, it. Oh, yeah, I, it I remember. Um, that same thing happened to me, I yeah. Did, <laughs> and then afterwards, I realized, oh, it's an AutoCAD thing. Um, then I did, obviously, a student license, jumped on that. Um, and it took me a while to get used to it. But once I did get used to it, I was like, wow, of course, this is brilliant. And just to mention, like, you know, um, to give credit where credit's due regarding Mache and Grant, both of those people are the reasons why I use the kind of pipeline I do today in terms of like, I, I, I don't use V-Ray now, but I used to use it a lot purely because of Grant and purely because yeah. of Mache championing that you should follow the way Grant builds shaders. Because back then there wasn't really like great knowledge of how, like to get cool shaders, it, Keyshot had its cool like glossy finishes, but you couldn't get that, you know, the wear and tear and the dirt and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, way, Grant, Grant was uh, simulating GGX BRDF fall off before uh, before V-Ray was. Exactly. So, and, and and even just, that's that's what I mean. So it was a lot of Grant's tutorials that I was following whilst I was uh, living in Birmingham. Uh -huh. uh, so a lot of the a, a lot of the knowledge that I have in V-Ray is, is solely down to him. He's such a badass. And again, that, that kind of, again, to begin is listening, or even anyone who's kind of just thinking about their workflow and how to adapt it, um, that's a great example of like, being experimental and having an open mind into um, new techniques. And kind of that contradicts in what I said before, like it doesn't really matter what tool you use um, because I'm just saying like, you know, try different things, which is sometimes you can like distill that into trying different tools. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately what these two guys are great at is extracting their creative fundamental knowledge and applying it into these tools to get, you know, that vision across. So whether it's to do with realism or just being able to, achieve results in a better way than they could have done before 
for sure. Yeah. And regarding um for yourself, it's like what is exciting you now in terms of tool space, like in the product design and industrial design realm, is it evolving into a into a different place or is it kind of still similar in terms of like a pipeline of, you know, like using CAD based software and then like the visual like, do you still use KeyShot for visualization or are you using Blender now? Um so me personally or, or yourself, yourself. Industry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I guess it's uh, a bit of both. Yeah, so Keyshot is, I think Keyshot is always going to be, at least for the foreseeable, is going to be a staple within mm. the industry. And I, I still use it pretty much on a, on a daily basis. For my personal work, I'll probably uh, use V-Ray going forward. Mm -hmm. But when working as part of a team that all know the same piece of software, um, that being Keyshot uh, is you know important to, to keep mm -hmm. on top of that. Um, in terms of different workflows within the industry, what, what is interesting to see is now everybody um, understanding how powerful a poly, a poly modeling workflow can be. Mm. And it, and it's, it's a, I think mainly it's come about because of, um, alias implementing, uh, something, a subdivision modeling yeah. method within its software. Um, I think that's really sparked a lot of interest in, in, um, poly modeling. So that's probably where it's come from, but, but yeah, that, that would be the biggest thing, which is, it's, it's crazy how something like that can just spark such a change because obviously poly, model, poly modeling has been around for such a long time mm -hmm. it's like why wasn't it used before mm -hmm. then um but yeah and the other one would be as you mentioned before um unreal engine uh there's a colleague of mine that uses unreal engine pretty much solely now as a replacement wow. for key shot and and i can completely understand why as well with real time it just makes such such a big difference and um obviously if i think he's using unreal engine 5 but right over the last few days, he's reverted back to Unreal Engine 4 just for the VR capabilities mm. to be able to, you know, assess um, uh, assess designs in VR is is a big part of, of our workflow, especially, you know, with working remotely. Um, it's not always possible to get everybody together at mm -hmm. the same time. So virtual reality is, is a big one too. Um, but yeah, for me personally, in terms of what excites me, I'm I'm at a point where... And I'm going to contradict myself now because I am learning Blender actually. So mm -hmm. actually, it doesn't make sense what I was about to say. What I was about to say was I'm pretty comfortable with where I'm at in terms of tools. Yeah. Um, but I can't ignore Blender for any any longer than I yeah. already have. <laughs> so I'm going to be I'm going to be picking up Blender, um, and then for me personally, it's going to be focused solely on on design. I think mm. for the next few years, um, I'm comfortable with with where I'm at in terms of my knowledge of the tools. And now I'm really just wanting to put what I, what I understand about those tools into practice and, and design things. And, and obviously the way, the way that I look at a render is, is that it's just a glorified sketch for me. Yep. yep um, yep. if you, you know, if you, if you're quick enough at it and you, um, you understand it well enough, then it can be done as quick as, you know, somebody might be able to throw out a sketch and, and do mm -hmm. a sketch render, um, which is, isn't too common these days, but, um, at least in, in industrial design. Um, but yeah, that, that's really what excites me at the moment is, is the prospect of being comfortable with where I'm at with my skill set and the mm -hmm. tools. Obviously, I'm going to pick up Blender, but um, once, once that's done, I'm going to be focused purely on design, which is the thing that really excites me. And that's a great segue into our next topic, design. Um, design, I guess, is, is quite simple to understand because when you say it, people kind of have an idea straight away what they mean. But then when yeah. you really dig into it, it can get very abstract and almost like, you know, um, there's not, I guess, any key thing that can define it in a way. Um, but yeah. what does it mean for you when you say design and when you say you want to focus on design? Oh, God. Uh, that's a, yeah. I mean, you said it yourself, that's a difficult question. Um, for me, I can only speak for myself, obviously. Um, but I think that again, it goes back to me drawing on the things that I was really passionate as a, about as a kid and, um, using the tools that I have in order to execute something that makes me happy. Right. That's, that's pretty much what it boils down to is doing something that makes me happy. Um, so I'm going to be leaning into a lot of the, the mech robotic stuff. There's so, so much to learn as you and everybody else I'm sure can appreciate um, but yeah, uh, mech design, uh, vehicles, uh, equipment, 
potentially like things like uh, props and weaponry. I, I don't know. I'm just gonna. Right, right, I'm right. gonna kind of go where where um, wherever it takes me. But I, I think that it would be wise of me to lean into the industrial design experience that I have mm-hmm. and try and create some uh, some badass stuff. You know, <laughs> um, but but uh, storytelling is a big a big part of that for me as well. So for the longest time when I was designing uh, products or at least, you know, personal projects where I was doing industrial design, it was all conceptual stuff, of course, but I would always try and attach some storytelling to that. So whether that be figuratively within the design itself, within the design itself, try and tell some kind of story um, through that or whether it was literally by giving this design a backstory. So I would create a fictional brand and the brand would have, um, you know, I, I would I would really think about who it was that was in charge of the company and why the company was founded and how mm-hmm. and where. Um, and I still do that now. I don't know if you saw the the recent um, robot stuff that I did, um, but that fictional company is called Empire, yeah. and I'm going to be putting a lot of time into that. And that's going to have you know that's going to have a backstory and all that kind of stuff just because I enjoy it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so so I, I'm I'm I was struggling to to implement stories into into products. Um, as I'm sure you can appreciate, there's not there's not too much scope to tell a story through a consumer yeah, yeah, electronic, yeah. right? Especially when compared to something like a vehicle or a, or, a, or a mech. So I, I really want to to bring the knowledge that I have about industrial design and then bring that into a more entertainment design space, almost, um, and just create things for for the love of it and and be able to tell stories again figuratively through the design, but also um quite literally with a backstory and that kind of thing and i have i have much bigger plans for the storytelling stuff that i'm, I'm not going to go into today um but cool yeah in terms yeah. of in terms of design that that's definitely the plan so yeah mechs vehicles all the stuff that uh that i used to love as a kid uh, and still love today but yeah i'm one million percent down like, i can't wait to see it obviously i've got your instagram open whilst we've been chatting um and i can see the and i follow your stuff daily anyway um or whenever you put oh, it thanks, up man. um so I'm, I'm aware of what you've been creating so yeah the the shot like the mech and stuff that you've been doing is, is sick um and the fact that to hear that you put in story behind it and stuff that's something that i appreciate a lot is um you know like almost like putting like you know like um another way to describe it is like putting law and stuff like you know um yeah exactly one of, one of my favorite games is the mass effect series and the amount of law that's in that game um yeah. or even like some Kojima games that I just that kind of stuff is just makes me happy at least as a creative yeah. right like I love to see that okay it's not just only you know like to use a common pun a pretty picture there's more to it but you put more thought into it than that and that that's what really makes it like for me that extra bit special um so yeah I'm super excited to see where that's gonna go and even just like your interpretation of how you're gonna you know like instill that into your creations um mm-hmm. what kind of designs are like you kind of go to i guess creations that you you go back to and think okay that's a great example of a great design or kind of stuff that i appreciate as an example of the level i want to reach or yeah. reinterpret in my own way yeah well it's it's a weird one so i feel i'm I get inspired. I try to be inspired by, um, as I'm sure everybody listening again can appreciate. I try to be inspired by everything, you know. So games, mm-hmm. like you mentioned, films, um, but that's that's usually like a how it makes me feel kind mm-hmm. of inspiration. Like it makes me. So the most recent one would be last weekend. I went to see the Batman, right? Um, and you leave the cinema wanting to get home, get to your desk, and do something. You don't know what, but you want to do something. <laughs> so, so there's there's a, there's a lot of different um, types of inspiration for me personally, and, and films and games is one of uh, making me feel a certain way that just wants to create something. And then another kind would be obviously being inspired by by other designers and artists. I mean, you can't talk about Mech without talking about Vitaly Bulgarov, mm-hmm. right? Like what a what a crazy crazy guy in the in the best way possible yes um but just insanely and i hate to use the word talented because it kind of suggests that that's just an, an inherent thing within you and it's not it was all worked for mm-hmm. um but but i there's <laughs> there's not too many other words but yeah a crazy talented guy um you mentioned ash thorpe earlier on um 
and Carlos Color Sponge as well. You know, the, I mean, there's too, there's too many to name, but <coughs> you get inspired by these guys in a similar way of like how they make you feel, and you you're just kind of in awe of of what it is that they're able to execute. Um, and and it's important for for you to believe that you can achieve those things as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, and yes. the di- the the difficulty should be how am I going to do that? That should be the thing that you're concerned mm. about, not whether or not you can do it, because you can do it. Any, anybody can do it. And I, and I mean that. Anybody who wants to do it can do it. And the difficult part is how do you go about doing that? How are you smart with, with your time and the things that you put your focus on? Um, so there's, there's that as well. And then in terms of inspiration, um, you know, things that I uh, draw on to, to implement into my own designs or, or find um, some kind of, not, not in the literal sense, like I'm going to take this piece and put it on mine. Like you should probably never do that. Um, but yeah, I still go back to the old Apple stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and I mean the like old Apple stuff with, uh, sorry, not, not old, old where we're talking about beige, beige boxes. <laughs> although, although sometimes, I mean, there's some cool stuff there too, but, yeah, I, yeah. but I love the, I love the old, um, transparent plastic stuff where you can see the yes, inner yes, workings yes. of it. And there's a, a new company um, that I'm not sure whether you'd, you've heard of, but they're called Nothing. And they're um, a startup tech company. And they, they're the closest thing for me that have come to what Apple used to be. Um, and they do some, they, they've created these new earbuds that just look insane. For, for anybody that's interested, I think it's nothing.tech. Um, is the URL? I might be wrong on that, but just if you Google that, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, and and just insane stuff, yeah, so cool. Um, so so there's things like that, and and um, I, I'm always reminded of something that my uh, lecturer at university said, and it was a question of, and I might be going slightly off topic here, but he said if if you're going to design a toaster, don't design a toaster. Ask yourself the question of what is the best way to toast bread mm-hmm. approach it yeah. approach it from that direction and it may end up not being a toaster whatsoever and you, you may find the that what should have been all along and i kind of take a similar approach in finding inspiration and things that uh, i like to draw on so if you're going to design um, a robot for example then a samsung washer machine might be something that has some really cool design features mm-hmm. that that you think could be implemented or drawn on for your own designs, right? So it's not you're you're appreciating the uh, details of something that has that bears no relevance on the thing that you're doing. I think that's a cool way to find literal inspiration. Mm. But ultimately, ultimately, it's got to come down to you and your own mental uh, library of shapes and things that you've stored over the years. Um, but yeah, what kind of do you ever get lost in inspiration? Or I guess the research phase and the, you know, the R and D phase. Um, yes, and so I try not to do it so much anymore. <laughs> and and funnily enough, um, it's ever since then that I've done my best work. I think so. Like the the robot stuff, for example. I think I had uh, three, maybe three images that I used. One of them was a, a suit of armor which I'm hoping kind of comes through in some of the designs. Maybe I've not been too successful in that, but mm-hmm. it was a suit of armor. I had um, a chimpanzee. Yeah. I had a chimpanzee that I used as reference for the general proportions yeah, yeah. And, and posture. Um, and the third <laughs> image, I can't remember what it was, so it must have been that important. But uh, yeah, but just three images. So yeah, there is a danger of getting lost in just looking at other people's work and being too influenced mm-hmm. by what everybody else is doing. And I think that you're, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice if you do that, because, um, you, you have your own experiences and you have your own visual library mentally, um, of things that, that you, that stuck with you, whether it's from films or games or whatever. And if, if you're able to go into designing something based purely on that, then it's, it's going to be as close to original as it can be Mm -hmm. uh, for where you're at right now. So, yeah, there is definitely a danger of looking at too much reference and getting lost in that. Um, oh, that's sick. And like you, the reference you mentioned, you can now you mentioned it, you can see it, but it wasn't yeah. that obvious before um, because, you know, like you're looking at a mech. So straight away you think, you know, like futuristic and cool technology and very advanced. Yeah, yeah those, those three items you mentioned um, are unique in their own aspects, 
uh, and to see that yeah that's that's sick that kind of stuff again i love that kind of stuff so yeah thanks for sharing that yeah, that's cool um no no problem and i just want to point out as well by the way like i'm so i think i started i think i finished this project maybe like a month ago and i started posting maybe like a week after that yeah. and and i'm at the point now where i'm looking back at at these images and i'm i'm not i'm not too i'm pleased with some parts of it and there are definitely parts that i'm, that I'm not happy with mm. um but I, I just wanted to make a point of the fact that it's, it's okay to be to be unhappy with something that you've done and you've put out there um but what's more important is that you're able to package up the mistakes that you made and the things mm. that you're not happy with and be able to take that into the next project um and, and not to beat yourself up about things so like this so the the one that i released you know uh, over the past few weeks is only my second attempt at, at designing a robot right, and right. um i hadn't done it obviously i hadn't done anything before that i decided that i wasn't going to do you know a hand study or a or like an arm or a leg study i was just going to go straight into it and try and do a full mech mm -hmm. and and so and you can see that i imagine somebody who's had a lot of experience with this stuff is looking at this and thinking, that is questionable because even i'm looking at some stuff and i'm thinking that's questionable you know <laughs> Um, but that's but that's the point though, right? Like yes. you're, you're not you're not going to learn unless you find out those mistakes for yourself. And I'm going to work over the next, you know, however many years it takes to to correct those mistakes and do do the best that I can. But you you have to be okay with with where you're at and just accept that, you know, this is this is the quality that I'm I'm able to achieve right now. And the next time I do it, hopefully it'll be better. And if not, then I've done something wrong. But uh, and, and that's kind I, of like... I thought it was just sorry. Go on. No, 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 please, please, don't. That's yes, quite. I was I was just going to say I thought it was important to highlight that for anybody that was um, because because there's been plenty of times where I put stuff out and a week later been completely miserable about mm -hmm. it. Um, but it's important, like I say, to to remember that so long as you package up the things that you don't like and and take that into the next project, then then you're, you're making progress. Now, I'm glad that you mentioned that because <clears throat> until you, I guess, like the creator themselves mentions that and declares that someone again like you know i keep um using beginners as an example um but you can apply to anybody um but um <clears throat> you know you can look at this and thinking okay this is excellent it is excellent and you think especially with the way social media is manufactured and all that kind of stuff um mm -hmm. you know it's like okay this is how it should be and oh my god you know this is way above my current level um and the fact that you know like you, to understand that or even acknowledge that okay even this wherever you see as a you know being the pinnacle of what greatness should be that the person who made that still is not happy with it or sees faults in it and um can do better is what you need to latch on to because it just shows that you know like and even like looking at design it's just part of the iteration process like this is one iteration and then you know like you're going to go back tweak it refine it make it even better um so yeah a couple of things to unpack with what you just said there is the, the fact that you know, um, even the stuff that you think is awesome, and it is awesome, the person who made it will still see flaws in it. The same way mm. you will see flaws in your own work. Um, so that's part and parcel. No matter what level you're at, that's always going to be there. All those people you mentioned before, like Vitaly and Ash, um, they've been quite vocal with that as well, saying that, you know, like you put it out there and realize, oh, you know, I'm only putting it out there because it had to be put out there. Otherwise, they could keep going on and on and on and to do that as well. Um, but even like just what you mentioned there about... Um, like you know putting it out there then realizing that okay there's that's that's like you know okay that can be improved that can be um changed or even removed completely it's like i'm heavily into f1 like it's i'm super yeah, obsessed. Me, too. me too perfect so you definitely get one when i go with this um you know like the way <laughs> those cars are built we were talking about inspiration before that is built purely out of necessity obviously you got like regulations that can really change how it can look but ultimately they're just trying to reach a top speed be one yeah. with the driver and all that kind of stuff and the the decisions they make at least visually um is purely based on a need and to solve a problem that the car's facing but yet if you just look at it for me at least anyway they just look super super awesome and yeah. by themselves look like a piece of art yet they're not trying to be a piece of art um you know yeah no you, yeah, exactly you, I mean, so, it's yeah. Yeah, you make a great point. But they're purely functional, and yet they look amazing. And so it's a, so. It, I mean, you could get very philosophical about that, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, we're talking with Formula One specifically. We're talking about the tiniest, tiniest changes that can make such huge 
impacts because for anybody that doesn't watch Formula One, one uh, one tenth of a second, so point one of a second, is a monumental amount of time in Formula mm-hmm. One. Um, and I can't I can't remember what it was. I'm going to butcher this, I'm sure, but I, I'm sure that I at least I think it was ten or fifteen years ago. Point one of a second was worth like a million pounds or a million dollars or something. I'm not surprised. Um, I'm sure that it's more now. I imagine it's more with with this with the speed of these things. Um, yeah, you're usually looking at one one hundredth of a second between these cars, um, and the 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 changes between them are so minute that it's so difficult to actually see the difference between mm-hmm. the cars. But there are big differences in terms of function, um, you know, especially with the the higher spenders on the grid. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, you're completely right, and especially with these new cars for the new season, they're they're, they're beautiful. Um, but pure function, like you say, and and that just makes it all the more pleasing, right? Like you can look at this thing and admire it for how it looks, knowing that it's just pure engineering. Um, so that would so Formula One vehicles would be a great place to to get um, to to gather inspiration from, and same with things like jet fighters, right? Military. Oh equipment. yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. Purely functional stuff. Um, Space, maritime, all that. Anything that's yes, yes. purely for a service and. You know, even like the way I take away F1 cars, for example, with the liveries and stuff, that's purely sponsorship. They do not care how they look, especially like with, yeah. with space vehicles, it's, it was well, and space tools and equipment. It's just a case of whatever that's needed to protect it or whatever else, that's what's going to go there. And it's interesting that that like, you know, like, for example, military stuff, the, you know, the camo colors and the military green and all that kind of stuff, that influences a lot of aesthetics that we see in the entertainment industry and beyond. Um, mm-hmm. But ultimately it's just there because it needs to be there um so no, that, that's quite cool but to kind of like diverge a little bit but i guess we could still focus on the inspirational aspect that how it inspires a creative um how much are you into f1 um how much am i well i used to I, the first race that i ever watched which i'm sure you can appreciate why it got me hooked on it um how old would i have been i think 11 maybe mm-hmm. 11 years old maybe 12 it was the final race of Lewis Hamilton's uh, championship win season. Do you remember what happened between him and Felipe Massa? Okay, yes, of course, of course. Yeah, so that that was the race that I watched um, and that was what got me hooked. And so since then, uh, in fairness, I've only been to one Grand Prix. I've not been to Silverstone, but I've been to Spa, oh, uh, cool. which, was, which was cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Lewis Hamilton crashed out on the first corner that oh, race. No, so, no, no. <laughs> yes, that was, not, that was not the best thing to happen. But, um, but yeah, and then... Um, I kind of uh, sort of shied away from it for a, for a few seasons. Um, and as I'm sure with uh, lots of other people, Drive to Survive came out and it sort mm-hmm. of reignited the passion uh, for the politics of it all. And, and, yeah, the, the, yes, yes, yes. and you kind of have to be invested in that in order to enjoy the sport almost. You have to enjoy the technical side of things and the politics and, and even the money. Like they're not, they're not shy about how big of a, a part money plays in the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm a big Formula One fan as as well as football and, and UFC. Oh, cool, I, I, cool. I enjoy enjoy watching. Like and and like, um, I think F1 particularly, at least in the sense like creatives and like even professionals, even it's I would definitely read too much into things in terms of you know like certain industries and disciplines just because I'm like always trying to look for like inspirations and extract things that maybe not even there but if I can make a connection and it, it makes sense for me I'll go with it um but like say with F1 for example and even talking linking back to what we was mentioning earlier on in the in the episode about where you were you know like working within a team it's you know like there's so much scope for stuff to go wrong let's take yeah. just only a race for example like we've all seen it where a pit stop goes wrong or like, you know, well, even like last year um, when Lewis, uh, sorry, when Verstappen ended up on Lewis's head purely because two yeah. pit stops got botched for uh, different reasons. Like the, the the impact it can have, whether it's in terms of outcome of a race, um, you know, like money. Money's a huge, like you mentioned, a huge, huge factor where like people live and die by whether you can fulfill a sponsor's wishes and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But then, you know, like when you realise that, say, like you mentioned about the big teams, in excess of well, thousands of people getting in, involved in creating this 
one well two machines because they've got two drivers ultimately I know there's a lot of parts and iterations for example yeah. but ultimately yeah. two machines for two people who are going to go around normally 50 to 70 times or just for two hours or so to extract the lap time and to win almost um yeah. and if someone doesn't do the job properly or you know like not putting down or on it but almost like how many moving parts whether figuratively and literally are required just to get this piece of machinery to do yeah. its job is phenomenal yeah and and this actually um links back to what we said earlier on about minimizing risk like mm. the if as a formula one team you can automate as much as possible and remove the risk of human error mm. the, the better right so we're actually seeing so the pit stops is a good example yes um i think the the green light situation after all the all four wheels have been changed became an automated thing. If I'm not mistaken, I yeah. think it was automated by uh, you know using sensors. And Formula One changed the rules to where that now had to be um, done by a person, right? Yeah. Um, so for the sake of entertainment and for the sake of adding more variables into, into the situation um, and to try and make the sport more entertainment, entertaining, um, the, that's something that they've done, right? So this kind of like like I've just said links back to what we were speaking about earlier on about if you can minimize the number of variables that might go wrong during your day or during your week or month or year, and set yourself up for success, then then the better, right? And it's the same same with Formula One. If you can prepare over and over again, if you can have a routine, if you can drill it, um, and you can reduce the number of variables throughout your day. Um, then, then the better, and you're setting yourself up for a better chance of, of success. Um, but, but also just going back to to inspiration as well. I think uh, we've spoken a lot about literal inspiration. So you might look at a Formula One car and, and create something based off certain elements of that, mm -hmm. and that's that's fine, especially for learning, right? Like if you're learning to poly model, we also mentioned that you might want to learn um, by modeling something that's already in existence, so you're not having to think about designing something that looks good because you're trying to do too many things at once there you're trying to create something and you're trying to le learn the tool whereas it wouldn't be a bad idea to learn the tool by creating something that somebody else has already done right so you're removing a variable there um but i, I think that it's much more valuable to operate on how something makes you feel um mm. so music music would be a good one right like if you're into heavy metal, I'm sure that's going to dictate how something, uh, you know, how you, how you create something and then what the final aesthetic is. If you're into, um, you know, hi-fi or something, you're going to be a lot more relaxed. Who, who knows what, what impact <laughs> music could have. But um, a good example for the, the mech that I did recently, uh, which is going to sound, and I think I actually wrote about this on Instagram, but, um, and, you, and you're going to think I'm very strange. Um, but uh, did, you, did you ever watch Wallace and Gromit as a kid? Yes, yes. One of the greatest. Yeah. So yeah, of course. So um, you remember a grand day out where they built the rocket and to go to the moon. To go to the moon because yeah, yeah, they think yeah. it's made of cheese. Yeah. Um, and um, do you uh, do you remember? So when they were basically preparing for takeoff, Gromit is sat inside inside the rocket waiting for Wallace to do all his checks. Um, and ultimately, Wallace ends up forgetting the crackers and they have to run outside. Yes. And, you know, you remember that scene. So, but before that, like I said, Gromit is sat there and he's got all these dials in front of him. He's got all of these flashing, blinking lights. And there's this weird, like, humming sound and just a bleep every now and again. And it's, it's, this, it's going to sound really strange, but that was one of the things that I constantly had going around my head when I was doing certain parts of... Mm. The mech, so especially when I was implementing like um, LEDs and things, the idea of um, something like Wallace and Gromit having influence on that, um, and then you know, so perhaps I might create something in the future where, um, you know, maybe the, maybe there's an animation there where that would be directly influenced by that. I don't know, but um, like I say, the, the the weirdest things can can inspire you if you allow yourself to just run on. Uh, feeling alone, I guess. Wallace and Gromit, it was definitely a weird one for me as well. But um, but yeah, that, that, that's a that good example. That definitely adds extra prestige points from me. That the fact that you used <clears throat> that in a design, like that. First of all, Wallace and Gromit 
it's part of my childhood so that's cool yes, um yes. but the detail you went into to you know like again that was almost like a kind of like a background noise of influence in the way you were creating that that's awesome as well but um, background noise is a good way to describe it i would say yeah and it, it goes back to what you mentioned before like about almost going back to like you know like the stuff that you enjoyed as a child like that, that childlike energy to create um you know what a better way than ultimately although i believe it's beyond well some is beyond like stuff for children but obviously it resonates more with children um yeah but now nah, that, that's awesome and i love those kind of i love those kind of easter eggs in anything whether it's in a film in a book in a game or whatever in a design even yeah. and you know like some people can argue that maybe product design and industrial design is has that kind of sterile look like it's almost like meant to please and that's it um yeah. but yet the way you just explained it as well like you know they you can have this level of law and input and influence um you can instill that into a design is like it's refreshing to hear and also encouraging to hear um, yeah um and for anybody that's not watched a grand day out her uh, wallace and grow it like I, I would recommend going watching it and hopefully hopefully when you you hear the sound and you you see this uh, this control panel you'll you'll know what i'm talking mm-hmm. about when uh when i say that i was i was influenced by that but yeah and just on just on um what you mentioned about industrial design in fairness to to the industry it's there are so many factors, right? Like there, there are so many engineering constraints that mm. the your original concept will likely be watered down. And that is just something that you have to accept. And that's mm-hmm. down to costing out things, you know, in the manufacturing process, you have a, a set cost, you know, um, a bill of materials that, that you can't exceed. Um, so certain elements that you would like to have are going to get costed out um, and engineering constraints design for manufacture or all things that need to be implemented into into the process and and it ultimately does affect the design and the the key and why it makes industrial design so special when it's done well is is overcoming those challenges um and it's why apple uh, uh, in my opinion uh, the uh, the gold standard um mm-hmm. because the the tolerances that they're able to achieve are second to none and Although they might look like aluminium boxes, which I agree, they, they probably could do something a bit more creative, but the that's not to take away from their achievements on that front by I mean, any means. Just to jump in on the, the Apple talk, um, I, again, I said working sales for a long time and a big chunk of that time was working basically in selling phones, selling Apple products, even before, like it's always been like in consumer electronics. Uh, electronics. Um, so I've sort of turned up Apple products in my time. Um, yeah. And it's and that on the, at the end of the spectrum. So right at the end of the whole process, from design all the way to like actually selling the product, there's one thing that no one's been able to touch Apple on is how their products look, how their products feel. That almost I've always described them to customers like you know it's like with Apple it's almost and even the way they pitch it as well and the way they package it, um, it's almost like you're buying jewelry um, as yeah. opposed to yeah. a piece of tech. And they've always gone with that look and. The other gripes that people have, uh, I've always found, was always, or the objection was always either price related or software related in terms of like, I can't do this on this. I can't do this on OS. It was never about that. That product looks ugly to me. It's always yeah. been the best looking thing. And as you just explained it, it's like, there's a reason behind that because they've put, you could say all their eggs in that basket of saying it has to look and feel and match this kind of level of prestige that we've built up on it. Yeah, I don't think anybody's getting anywhere close to um, Apple when it comes to build quality. I mean, when it comes to phones, Samsung are obviously, they have a lot of competitors that have really great build quality Mm -hmm. in that that specific sector, in all fairness. But when you look at um, laptops, for example, nobody's getting close to them. The build quality of a MacBook is just out of this world. I can not ever come close. No, I... Never. Yeah, I, there was a few times where I thought maybe, and then when I've actually mm-hmm. tried to, I'm like, no, it's just not. It's just not the same. And I mean, I'm talking to you now on a MacBook that I bought in 2014. I've mm. just never, never had a problem with it. Um, and and this is not be this is not me being an Apple fanboy. Like they're definitely not perfect. They do some questionable things and they course, make some course, yeah. questionable design choices, as does everybody. Um, but what I will say is that we we don't know the inner workings and and the the logic behind some of those decisions. Um, so yeah, not, not to be an Apple fanboy. I do think <laughs> that they're up there with, I think they are the gold standard in terms of uh, des- um, build quality, at least. Um, 
Yeah, like, but it's the it? same. But it's the same with everybody. Like the, yes, the, yes. the the amount of constraints that you have to work to in industrial design is is crazy. And like, with constraints, do you see that as a positive or a negative? Like personally speaking, as a, as a creative yourself and as a designer yourself, like do um, you find that your designs are better? Even with your personal stuff, because there's always like there's always something that is a some form of a constraint, whether it's time or even just the the topic you're tackling. Um, do you think that's a a good thing or a bad thing to have constraints? Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's either a positive mm. or a negative. I just think it is what it is, right? It's mm-hmm. just it comes down to logic. I mean, if we're talking specifically about industrial design, for example, where you have these constraints, it is it is what it is, unless you throw more money at it and you throw mm. the best possible engineers or something to overcome an issue in a new way. Um, it is, it is what it is. You don't um, have that. And I, and I try to actually take that into consideration in doing concept design stuff purely because I would like my, because I have that knowledge, right. And I would, it, I think it would be smart for me to lean into the knowledge that I do have. So thinking about how something might be manufactured. So if I know that it's going to be an injection molded part, um, then I will design it as such. And if I know that it's something that could be, you know, extruded aluminium, then again, I'll design it as such. So I'm thinking about materials and how I'm going to render something mm-hmm. whilst I'm modeling, because you, you have to think about what material something's going to be in order to consider how it's, how it's going to be manufactured and all the other way around. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely implementing that stuff, but that is purely for aesthetics, right? Mm-hmm. Because Logically, it doesn't make any sense to do that if it's conceptual and if it's um, if it's for entertainment design. Essentially, it doesn't make sense to give yourself those constraints. But um, it would be smart to to learn about manufacturing processes and, and engineering constraints, just purely to make your designs more believable, right? Mm-hmm. So, like if we take joints, for example, that's one thing that I want to put. A lot of, and I mean joints as in mechanical joints, not a, not, <laughs> not, uh, <laughs> any illegal, not any illegal substances. Um, but um, yeah, if we if we take mechanical joints into uh, as a, as an example, you in entertainment design, you don't obviously don't need to create an actual functional joint unless that is specified, right? But a good understanding of, and by the way, I'm making all kinds of assumptions here. I haven't worked in the entertainment industry, but I have a fair understanding. Um, But if you have a decent understanding of um, how mechanical joints work and how they function, then you're going to be able to create a design with at least um, perceived functionality, right? Which Mm. if you're purely a concept designer, that is all you're going to need to be able to create perceived functionality. And then somebody that might want to take your design and actually make it functional. Yeah, that's a different story, mm-hmm. right? But um, but yeah, having to come back to your original question, I think it would be good to give yourself constraints in the sense of understanding engineering issues and, and manufacturing processes just to be able to give your designs a more believable aesthetic. But that's the only reason. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't put actual real world constraints on yourself if they're not necessary. So but yeah, be be methodical and logic logical about it. But but yeah, I think it's worthwhile to at least understand them. I have two more questions for you before we wrap up. <clears throat> um, the first one is, what does I guess the future hold for you? I guess as far as you know, or at least in terms of for the rest of the year, like what can we look forward from you? Um, and even maybe a little bit beyond, like you mentioned it as well, like what you're wanting to do in terms of projects and everything else as well. Um, but like maybe more of a long-term vision for yourself. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm very happy at arrival. Um, I'm very happy with with the mission that we're on. Mm. Um, I love the people that I work with, and I love the fact that I get to do this for a job, and uh, you know, run a, a small team of visualizers who who all share a passion for the same thing. Like I, I can't express how grateful i am um to to not to anybody in particular but just grateful in general for um for for being able to do this for a job so the foreseeable future future is is definitely with arrival um Mm -hmm. but but as we spoke about before that's that's the day job right um it might go beyond the hours sometimes that that are required and, and that's all fair it's all part and parcel of 
being a part of a startup company where time is very, very critical. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to make sure that uh, the business is a success. It's as straightforward as that. We need to all pull our weight to make sure that this business is successful. Um, so yeah, the foreseeable is, is with arrival, but in terms of personal projects, like I said, um, I'm going to put some time into Blender, which I'm very excited about. And I have used Blender in the past, so it's not like I'm starting completely fresh, but putting a lot of time into hard surface modeling within Blender um, is something that I'm keen to do. And then beyond that, I have plans to, again, as I mentioned before, drawing on the stuff that I, that makes me happy. Um, I really want to, to put that into uh, mech design, vehicle design, wh whatever it is that I really fancy doing, mm. to be honest. Um, and then beyond that, the truthfully, I think that I, I would like to think that my future does lie in the entertainment space. I mm -hmm. think that that is, that's, that's the thing that's truly going to make me happy, but I also want to be prepared for that. You know, I, I want to make sure that I have the skills necessary and I'm able to do it at a speed that I'm, that I'm really happy with, um, in order to actually contribute to a team on a production. Um, whether I'm there yet or not, I don't know, but I'm, I'm definitely working towards that. Um, and just the idea of it makes me, you know, makes me excited. So that's, that's more of a, a long-term thing, I think. But, but as I've said, happy with where I'm at right now. I'm happy with the idea that I'm putting myself back through this apprenticeship of, of learning new tools and, and new skill sets more importantly. Um, and, and yes, yeah, see where, see where the next couple of years takes me. Now, that's like exciting to hear and I'm super excited to see more of your journey and how it progresses, not just only in the stuff that you create, but also in terms of like how your career and just like almost like your, I guess, art life develops because careers are like an interesting word, it's, but it's always linked to job stuff. Uh, or maybe that is like the ultimate blend of like a job and a hobby. But, I, you know, like we alluded to before as well, it's like, creative stuff and creating as a creative almost goes beyond that even so yeah just to see how that develops for you yeah. um i'm excited to see and i'm sure i speak to many of the people and of your fans as well that think the same way and um on to my final question tomorrow well not tomorrow this weekend the new f1 season starts what yeah. are your, what are your predictions or what would you like to see happen um who would you like to see yeah. win the championship constructors or just what you'd like to see in general with this almost brand new, but it is brand new, fresh, almost factory reset of the regulations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting because last season was supposed to be essentially a stopgap season for this, right? Because we yeah. have, like you said, we, we've had so many regulation changes and rule changes that this was the season that we were supposed to be excited for. And last season was supposed to just be like, a, let's get through Dead this over. and let's yeah. get to 2020. Yeah, exactly. And last season ended up being arguably the greatest season of formula one ever um so i mean sorry, was, just to, just was, to jump in there quickly since you've yeah. been watching f1 because you obviously you said what hooked you was lewis's first win that yeah. has to be the best season you've ever seen right um well no because that was the first race i watched was the final race of that season okay like so i, I can't say with all honesty that it was um mm. i think I'm, I question whether or not the Lewis Hamilton Nico Rosberg rivalry was more Ooh. was more interesting just interesting. because it was the same team, right? Um, but I think in terms of drama, um, I, I I do think that last season was up there for sure, and especially with the way that it ended in such controversy, right? Controversy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it was. I think it's definitely up there. Like I said, arguable. I wouldn't be unhappy with with anybody that said Lewis Hamilton's first championship winning season was uh, was up there. I, I mm. wouldn't be upset with that either. Um, but yeah, predictions for this year. I'm I'm all out Lewis Hamilton this year. Last season, last season, I I, I wasn't too unhappy with the idea of Max Verstappen winning, which mm -hmm. is painful for me to say as a Brit. Mm -hmm. But um, but for the sake of the sport, I think we needed that. Um, I'm not happy with the way that it happened. Yeah. I think Lewis probably was deserving of it in the end, and I do think there's, uh, there's. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be upset with anybody that said that Lewis Hamilton was robbed last season. Mm -hmm. um, there is definitely an argument for that. Um, but yeah, I'm Lewis Hamilton all the way this season. I want, I want him to win that, um, 
that eighth world championship. And I would also like to see him again, as much as it pains me to say, I would like to see him retire after that eighth, mm. um, that eighth championship, just because I would like to see him go out on a high. Um, but yeah, that, and I think that'll happen as well. I think Lewis Hamilton wins the the next next season. Um, but I but I'm a big fan. But it's it's so hard to, to like pick a favorite driver as well, right? Like I'm sure you can agree. Like Lewis has to be has to be number one as the greatest of all time for me, and as a Brit. Uh, but Lando Lond, Lando Norris is a character. Um, Daniel Ricciardo is obviously a character. I really like Charles Leclerc. Um, yeah, so. I'm, I'm excited. It's a, it's a good grid in terms of um, just drivers in general. Like ever since yeah. I've been watching it, for me, it was like I started watching it or really got into it more towards the middle to end of Schumacher's era, like when he was super successful. I remember like watching Damon Hill back in the day and Nigel Mansell, just like glimpses as a kid. Yeah. But that was when it really like Mika Hakkinen. Basically, I was a McLaren guy. Um, so seeing Lewis yeah. win, that was like awesome to see. Um, but ever since then, there's always been like two or three that have been like, well, there's always been one great one, one rival and then a fan favourite. Um, yeah. But like, even the like last season, yeah, take away Lewis, who's ultimate goal. Verstappen, clearly a cut above the rest. Um, but then the rest of the pack, um, it's arguable, obviously, with F1 to like, it's always about, it is about the car, of course. Um, but let's assume that, you know, I still stick by the fact that Lewis is still the best driver and then Verstappen probably would be second or close, battling right for the first. But, for the rest of them, there's like there's so many people that are on the same level. Um, Definitely. Different strengths, and that's awesome to see. I mean, um, look at Pierre Gasly, what, what he, oh, he got I out of. I think he's awesome. I think he's awesome. Yeah, he's um, a great driver. And uh, even even Ocon, I think Ocon's underrated. He just flies under the radar. If he, <laughs> all, if you could, you could say it about all of them. Yeah, really true, could, could, true, true, um, true. Like um, Carlos Sainz is another one. But oh, uh, yeah, so yeah cool. I mean, we could go on. Let's let's hope next season as well that McLaren rocks that golf livery again because that was beautiful. That was I would cool. love for that to be their um, their main livery for the season oh, rather than just awesome. Monaco. But it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Dude, we'll leave it at that because I could go in about F1 all day and design all day and I could chat to you all day as well. But I'm sure you got many things to do. Um, thank you for jumping on. It was great hearing your insights and your wisdom. And mm -hmm. we should definitely no do problem. this again. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really grateful for the uh, for the invite, and I've had like you said, I've had I've had a really great time. I could go on about Formula One and design all day too, um, but need to need to get back to it now. But um, yeah, like I say, re really grateful, and um, thank you to everyone that's stuck around for however long it's been. Awesome. A massive thanks to Sean for an amazing conversation, and I really admire the passion he has for his craft. Hit the links in this episode's description to give Sean a follow and to see what he's up to. Then, head on over to learnsware.com and take your own career to the next level. Take Industry Design Foundations, which is the same course Sean has taken himself. Or, simply check out the rest of our library. And we've made it easy for you to do this, as all of our first lessons are free. I've been your host, Darren Danda. Till next time.